I mean, oyo as a mabi apan, the person that made us all. La persona que nos hizo a todos. Namaseki when it can asogo we mab anandegwan. Or we stand upon the earth that we talk about. Estamos sobre esta tierra de la que hablamos. Ah, nema oyo as a keep oyo. So we mab anan. Sasuakan. And we uh, talk about the happiness that we get from the earth. Firstly, I will tell you, recount to you, Kampung Sorowako, sebelum PT Inko mengelola tambang. To give you an idea of what the what Sorowako was like before Inko came. Kehidupan penduduk di sana adalah bertani. The uh, local people lived from uh, tilling the land, from uh, growing rice. Dan di sekeliling danau terdapat pohon yang pohon-pohon yang sangat bagus. And in that area around the big lake, there were trees, fruit-bearing trees. When you hear the stories of the elders from the Yellow Knives Denny First Nation, they, they talk about how the uh, area was uh, very clean, people were able to uh, go and gather berries where the mine sites are, they were able to fish uh, right in uh, Yellow Knife Bay and in Back Bay on the other side. In the beginning, there were no problems for those who didn't want to work for we didn't want to work for the company, but when they started digging trenches, the problem began. It was impossible to go to the places we used to work before. When they take a mountain and destroy it, there's uh, our stories, you know, the, we don't have written language like this. Our stories belong to that mountain. Our stories belong on that uh, on that land where our people are buried, um, and our names are there. You know the names of the mountains. They're names of people, places, stories. So, in doing that, they've. Um, they uh, perpetrated genocide. Before the man started, uh, people, people were doing their own way of small scale mining. And um, they lived with it for about 400 years. The land was almost the same. People were, others were farming, others were doing their own thing. Until about 10 years ago, when this, 10, 12 years ago, when this large scale multinational companies Lots of, especially Canadian mining companies, were being invited by the Surinamese government to uh, come to Suriname to work. And these companies have been working, most of them have been working in indigenous and maroon territories. The government passed a law that facilitated exploration and, and exploitation of the lands through forced work. From that time on, we started thinking about our position in the country and we came to several conclusions. We were not consulted by the government before they made an arrangement with Golden Star. The, all, the, all the projects that get to Mexico, they well, to this area, they, they've been accepted because the government always gets some share from this from this project. So what we discovered is that these, these companies uh, want to, basically their strategy is to change Colombian law to uh, displace the uh, through, through paramilitary actions, displace the small-scale miners in the region, and then take control of all of the mines. 
they don't they don't really um, take into account the damage that they're doing to the communities, their culture, and to the environment. Among the uh, rather unusual uh, elements of this new code for mining is the clause that says that you can mine in national parks, uh, sites of uh, architectural and historical importance, preserves for wildlife and so on. Most of it because they don't give any value to it. They don't have an economic value for these resources or for the culture. And since they have an economic revenue from, from the companies, it's, it's better for them to accept the project. The government and Golden Star made plans to relocate us without our knowledge. 31 maroon communities were relocated on behalf of Alcoa's subsidiary in Sweden Alcoa's uh, to build a, a hydroelectric dam. Almost 6,000 people were relocated without being com compensated and under lots of false promises by the government. A whole year before any displacement of populations of communities has begun, a whole year before any of the, the paramilitary activity and repression has begun in this mining area, the, the Congress is already considering an, uh, a law that says that it will aid uh, miners, uh, small-scale small miners who are displaced from their lands. They set up a security in which the police is taking part. We can't do mining activities in our neighborhood because we can be shut down by the security. We have no rights on the ground we were living on, and the mineral rights are in hands of the government. Este es el mapa de la presencia militar norteamericana en Colombia. This is the map of the, North, uh, of the American uh, military presence in Colombia. Y si usted ve las bases militares norteamericanas are, están muy bien repartidas. These are all military Amer American military bases and you can see they're very well distributed in the country. Y están cercanas a toda la riqueza mineral colombiana. They're well distributed because they're they're placed right in areas that are that have a lot of uh, mineral resources. <coughs> y en esas bases militares norteamericanas se entrenan Los militares que luego, eh, vestidos de paramilitares, asesinan a toda nuestra gente. And on these American military bases, they train uh, Colombian military officials who, who later on, dressed as paramilitary uh, members, uh, assassinate a lot of the miners and, and other people in the country. My community, which really values its land and, and all over its land uh, has really tried to resist this whole process. We have successfully been able to defeat two of these attempts to have our lands forced over to the company. And upon this earth, upon which things grow, Upon which we walk, upon which we live, Nemungo Sugobi Sundai Niwaikan. So we ask for blessings on those. Eh, pedimos que se bendigan eh, las cosas sobre las que caminamos y de las de lo que crece en esta tierra. Saya tertarik. I am interested Dengan kawan -kawan telah in your stories that you have shared so far Di mana ada pertambangan. where you too have been affected by mining Sebagian bisa menjadikan penduduknya bahagia. Some of you may have managed to make your peoples happy Tapi di tempat kami sangat berbeda. But in our case that has not been the case. Penuh dengan hutan. My region has had uh, pristine forests. Dano yang bersih. Uh, a, a lake, a, a clear lake. Tapi adanya PT Inco di sana. But the arrival of Inco has. Hutan habis digusur. Has resulted in uh, logging of the forest. 
Danau jadi kotor. And the uh, the lake has been uh, contaminated. In Peru, in Peru, almost all of the major rivers and watersheds have been contaminated. The mines are very high up in the mountains, above uh, 4,300 meters, and uh, they're in a place where two uh, rivers are born, the Guayaga and the Mantaro, and both of these rivers are contaminated right from their source. And it's just across the lake too from, from our community and you know sometimes when it's windy all the dust from the pit then it just goes into the lake and sometimes we find fish that are floating in the lake and some fish we find that are blind and some small fish that will be floating and and still they, they deny that nothing nothing is wrong, that everything is okay. Situated right next to that village of about uh, 2,500 people, uh, sat the largest open pit uranium mine in the world, which was in operation from 1952 to 1982. Okay, this mine was left unreclaimed for uh, at least uh, 14 years. Okay. So radioactive contaminants, as you see there, uh, seeped into the groundwater. You can see uh, the dendritic patterns of arroyos here that flow from the mine site that eventually flow into uh, uh, irrigation areas where we watered our corn, our vegetables, watered our livestock, you know, so the impact of that whole process got into the, the chain of, 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 of human consumption, you know, we uh, also, you know, uh, when we, uh, uh, about this time of the year, we have, in the spring, we have windstorms that sometimes exceed 60 miles an hour. Okay. And these radioactive contaminants are blowing all over grazing land where sheep and cattle consume the grass in close proximity to these areas. We butcher the animals and we consume them, just like our fruit and vegetables. And um, this mine that we're talking about is situated on a, a permafrost. And at the time when they started mining, they um, didn't think that the permafrost would melt as fast as it's melting now. And this is, this is when they started having problems with their tailings ponds. Um, this started in late 1995 when they had, after they had started and it had continued until the time they shut down. They were forced to shut down in 1998. Since, since 1998, when, the, when the, the mine had shut down, the federal government took over. And they've been trying to figure out how they're supposed to treat this, the water that's keep filling up fast and overflowing. And this water runs into the Dome Creek area, or uh, Dome Creek, and then it goes into the Yukon River, which is our major, major waterways in the Yukon. But we were told that this process, like when we were expressing concern about this thing going into the Yukon River, we were told that by the time it gets down to the water, it'll, there won't be any, any, any chemicals or any poison going into the water. The agreement that was officially signed stipulated <coughs> that there should be three tailings spawn. They anyway started with only one. When 3.2 billion cubic liters of cyanide spill into one of Guyana's main river, the Essequibo River. The area was declared a disaster zone, which was about 100 miles long, with a population of about 23,000 people. The people are still and will continue to experience illness, like scratching of the skin, diarrhea, vomiting, 
some deaths, and even blindness. So since February of 1996, the company has admitted that it's dumping cyanide and other heavy metals as part of the to toxic effluent from the mine. They admit that they're dumping these chemicals into the river on a regular basis. And they have the audacity to tell the people that it's good for them, the water is good for them. There's a city that has grown up around the gold mines. And the gold mines, uh, the way they operated for the first few years, they uh, roasted the ore, they would heat it up to get off the uh, sulfur and the arsenic that was in the ore. And that has uh, uh, killed a lot of the vegetation around the community and left a lot of uh, arsenic in the soil. And uh, there's concern about what it has done to people's uh, health. We seem to have higher than normal cancer rates in, in, in our community. And well, arsenic is a proven carcinogen in people. And uh, so it's stored underground. We know that some of it is uh, leaking out. This stuff is uh, soluble in water, it dissolves in water. And, and it's only a few hundred meters away from uh, Great Slave Lake, a very large lake, which is the headwaters for the Mackenzie River, one of the biggest river in Canada. And of course it's a, it's a real concern for the workers at these mines too. We've lost some very close people that we used to work with. We've lost them to cancer. And we've also lost our own family members. So it's, it's a terrible, terrible way to make a living if you have to deal with the uranium mine. And so we talk about uh, our children and children way beyond that because for us it's like a big circle, you know, like uh, it's not a myth, it's a circle and they say that, you know, when you have children and your children's children, but when the miners leave there'll be nothing for us and nothing for our children except torn up mountains and they call this reclamation they um, make mountains put a little grass on there but the mountains aren't there there's just hills we have seen uh, environmental devastation we have seen uh, social change. We have seen the traditional and cultural lifestyles of our people impacted by uranium mining. It's really a result of a fact or a situation that's common in many of these stories. One in which poor people, the human rights and the environment are not respected by either governments or many of the companies that are working in these areas. Now we want to take a little bit of time to talk about what are the strengths we have as communities. What are the strengths that help us to be able to, to sustain the difficulties that we, that we face and also to confront the, the mining companies. What are the strengths we have as communities? We've taken uh, initiatives toward community empowerment, community education. We have a history of uranium mining that has been implemented into the curriculum at the fifth and seventh grade levels of our elementary and middle schools at Laguna Pueblo. Uh, as I told you, we have this National Institute of Educational Health Sciences grant to conduct health studies among former mining populations. And uh, today, what we concentrate most of our efforts toward is 
health issues in the community due to the fact that many of that 80% working population were exposed to high levels of radioactive contamination. So consequently we have cancer clusters in our community. We, we have seen a generation of minors already, we have buried already a generation of minors and we are beginning to see the younger mining generation suffer the same health consequences of cancer related illnesses, respiratory related illnesses that uh, impact that mining population. The underlying question is what can the people do to survive once they are walking literally on the gold? It means alternatives have to be created for people, alternative ways of surviving. I know of the indigenous community, some of them have, they are engaged in ecotourism and lots of other activities. So it's, it's a matter of discussion. It's a matter of educating the people so that people can be aware that even though the gold is a way of surviving, it's not the only way of surviving. <coughs> What is the objective of the, of the National Coordinating Committee? Defender el derecho a la tierra. To defend the right to land a un ambiente sano and a clean environment para las futuras generaciones. for future generations. Hacer respetar la autonomía de las comunidades sobre el uso de los recursos naturales. Coordinating Committee is also working to recognize the autonomy and sovereignty of communities over the use of uh, natural resources. Promover la participación de las comunidades como beneficiaria directa de los proyectos mineros. We promote the participation of communities as direct beneficiaries of mining projects. Proponer reformas constitucionales y legales. We propose constitutional reforms and, and, uh, and legal reforms. Denunciar ante organismos internacionales los abusos cometidos contra los derechos de las comunidades. And we, did, we denounce before international organizations and international bodies the abuses committed against the rights of communities. Organizar campañas a nivel nacional e internacional por la, por la no contaminación por las empresas mineras. And we, we've also organized uh, campaigns at the national level and at the international level uh, against the contamination by uh, uh, mining companies. Going back to what I was saying, having fought with the big companies for six years and not got it because of their power and their money and their influence with the government. We decided to change our approach and to try and prevent a new mine starting up in Papua New Guinea. This new mine intends to mine nickel and cobalt, the same as we heard from our friends in uh, Indonesia, and to dump their wastes in the sea. We started early on this campaign and we focused across the board in attacking them in a variety of different ways. On the ground, we went to those communities that were likely to be affected by the mine and we undertook a major education program with them that involved going out to villages, conducting slideshows, showing them videos and taking them to other parts of Papua New Guinea to show them what the sorts of mining impacts they could expect. The effect of that was when the mining company went to their area to explain what the likely impacts would be, they didn't believe a word of it and they kicked the mining company out. The government in many cases, um, the public service that is, is reasonably good in Papua New Guinea in terms of where their hearts are, but very poor in terms of what's in their heads. So we were able to access scientists to redo and rework a lot of the company propaganda and a lot of the company scientific reports to actually provide a lot of assistance to the public service in Papua New Guinea to be able to comment on what the mine wanted to do. In this way, backwards and forwards between different government departments, we were able to slow down um, the, the company in its, um, in its acquisition of licenses to actually conduct its activities. Each time the company redid their scientific reports, we got our scientists involved and redid them again, showing how they had lied, how they had made up their data. And this proved to be very effective. We slotted this material into 
radio networks into the newspapers and publicised it widely. And so the company's name in Papua New Guinea gradually became worse and worse. However, the key to what we hope has been our success has been tackling this company in the financial markets in Australia, where we approach them on a number of fronts. Through the Mineral Policy Institute in Australia, we sent out information to every stockbroker in the country explaining why this company posed a great risk to shareholder value, why there was a great likelihood that shareholder money would be lost if they invested in this company, which resulted in many stockbrokers refusing to sell the listing of this company on the open market. We then went to the risk insurance people in Australia and in Europe. Most of these big projects obtain government risk insurance. Uh, this means that uh, public money is guaranteed by governments uh, in case the project goes wrong. So we were able to convince the Australian government not to give this company risk insurance because the likelihood was that it exposed the Australian government to an ex extreme embarrassment when the company finally uh, started to cause problems on the ground. In this way, what we've been able to do now for two years is to hold up the project completely and, and as well prevent the company from getting access to the money that they need to develop the project. We feel that if we can continue this for another six months, we'll probably win in that a company in its early stages only has a certain amount of money to, uh, to spend. So in this particular situation, while we're hopeful of success, as a consequence of the past mining projects in Papua New Guinea and the damages that they caused, a very small group of us in some ways took a massive responsibility upon ourselves um, to try and hold up what many would see would be a, uh, a wonderful economic development for the country. Um, it comes down to personal belief, but uh, having seen the impacts and the lack of benefits that have come from all of the other projects in the country, uh, we feel we're certainly justified in going about this. I think we have all started something very important. We have taken a big step to prevent Mother Earth from being destroyed and for more people from being destroyed. The uh, communities must be trained in the environmental impact assessment, uh, understanding of the environmental impact assessment, so that uh, they would be able to um, you know, contribute or um, effectively um, uh, negotiate with the, uh, the mining companies uh, when it comes to uh, the issue of public hearing. Uh, because in most cases, they don't understand the technicalities involved in um, the EIA process and therefore are not able to contribute effectively. I think we also have to acknowledge the sovereign right of indigenous people to choose um, to either approve or deny a mining project or development project. That they will be able to, to, have, to make an informed, intelligent judgment whether to concede or to to say no, because I think to concede also is a right. But oftentimes, as, as we were saying, uh, we, we are being bamboozled by misinformation to say yes. So I think the key element there is access to information. I know it's hard to continue this work. And for me, I feel revitalized listening to all of you my brothers and sisters here. Continue your work. I feel happy meeting with uh, other local communities, other mining activists. And I, when I go home, I will continue my uh, advocacy in my community. And it, lastly, you know, our, our elders, you know, in this traditional versus progressive division that has been created in our community based upon money 
and dividing communities, as our uh, brother from Ghana said, and our brother from uh, Suriname said, you know, that you know, money was used as the incentive. You know, even though our elders had always told us, you know, to destroy the land was to destroy the people. And unfortunately, we didn't listen to the traditional community. And today, we're paying dearly for not having no eyes and no ears, or our leaders back then not having no eyes and no ears in listening to the traditional elders. We're fighting because they're knocking the mountains down into molehills. And those mountains are the places where our stories are. They're places where we pray. And they're places where our ancestors have been buried. So um, we're always arguing with the United States that um, that land belongs to us. Dan saya sadar. And I'm, Tidak. I'm aware that Bukan karena perbedaan ras, perbedaan bahasa. That it's not differences in race and language. Tapi yang perlu keyakinan membela yang benar. But that what is important is the commitment and belief in justice and doing what is right. Eh, yo resumo lo que les he expuesto con esta frase. To conclude uh, and to sum up what I've said, I'd like to leave you with this thought. Eh, si los gobernantes caminaran más por los suburbios donde habitan sus gobernados, uh, if those who govern walked more in the suburbs and, and places where the governed live, se percatarían mejor de los nuevos vientos que pugnan por instalarse en la vida de los excluidos de los beneficios de la globalización. They would uh, be more aware of the new winds that are blowing and that are that are becoming more prevalent uh, among the the lives of those who are excluded from the benefits of globalization. Verían una enorme cantidad de muros. They would see enorm an enormous amount of walls donde pobres que no tienen nada que perder where um, poor people who have nothing to lose han empezado a redactar a través del grafitis have started to write with graffiti on the walls el preámbulo de la nueva declaración de la independencia de América the preamble of the new declaration of independence of the American continent cuando el hambre es ley la rebelión es justicia when hunger is the, the rule and the law the rebellion is justice